I tied so much of my self-worth to like how busy I was and how occupied I was that it really affected the way I thought about like myself. So I ended up in rehab and I was there for addiction to work. Nadia is here still in her PJs. Yes. <laughs> Don't let her fool you. And with her dog. She has made herself at home. <laughs> I covered up my PJs with a sweatpants suit though. So I feel like it's more professional. <laughs> We're a little more presentable. Yeah. <laughs> But they're like a silky matching Valentine's Day set that I got in the mail. Kind of love. Kind of want you to take the sweater. Because I was like, I was thinking, I was like, you know, if she's also cozy, then like, you know, then I could just wear the PJs. I almost wore just the PJs and I was like, oh, it's like a suit. But then I was thinking it was raining outside. So I kind of want you to because also like it's red. It's on brand. Wait, here. Let me get in my PJs. Yeah, we're we're period positive over here. (laughs) show you it's actually oh my. hilarious the way she's in braids pjs with her dog <laughs> you've literally moved in <laughs> i that's why when i say i was like oh i'm gonna come early this will be great for your video <laughs> i'm like fully in my matching pjs it's the valentine's day episode yes wait i should totally save this for mimi where are you going mm-hmm. Oh my god! And your shoes are red too. Are you just constantly on brand, or it's yes. like unintentional? No, the goal. I mean, I think it's unintentional now because I've built my wardrobe to be about my brand, kind of. So like, I actually have a fading tattoo of my logo. August is, is my company because it was one of those like six month tattoos. Got it. But it's been two and a half years. So <laughs> would you would you get a for real one? I think so. And August would be the. I think well. I'm not opposed to, to getting it. I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm very I ha- do not have a tattoo that's like of per- a period thing, but I'm like not opposed to it. Right. Yeah. I feel like I'm obsessed. I don't have any tattoos, but I'm like dying for a red one. And I feel like if yeah. anyone can pull it off, it's you. Yeah, honestly, or is that overkill? like a little blood drop or something <laughs> that might be in my future. I love like the little wicked ones <laughs> on your face. Imagine. I don't know about that, but you know, we'll try. Can you imagine? Okay, well, Mimi's in studio. I want to start with just defining terms that I think everyone should know and that I literally didn't know about until I started consuming your content. And that should just show you alone, like the impact that you're making. But as a woman, I'm like, how did I not know this? It comes with an immense amount of privilege, obviously. So can you define, let's start with period poverty? Yeah, I define period poverty as just not being able to afford period products, right? If you think about poverty being not being able to afford basic necessities, things like, you know, even just struggling to afford shelter, water, food, period poverty is just not being able to afford the basic necessities you need for your period. So tampon pads, it might look like Advil. Um, And so anyone who's experiencing poverty is and gets a period is likely experiencing period poverty. But it's interesting that you call them necessities. Yeah. Because the government doesn't correct yeah so I mean I think it's changing now the number when I first started doing all this work 10 years ago was 40 so like 40 states in the United States used to have a sales tax on period products considering them non-essential goods right and there are items throughout states where they are exempt from sales tax because they're considered medical necessities or necessities in general and tampons and pads often don't fall into that category 21 states still have the tampon tax. So we have quite a bit of ways to go. We're making progress. But I think there are also examples where period products, you know, have not been considered uh, as covered by food stamps and things like that. And so um, we're still working to get period products to be free in schools, shelters, prisons, um, and provided just as any other necessary products. And what are some products that would blow people's minds that they don't have the sales tax and they are considered necessities as opposed to tampons, pads? Well, Rogaine, Viagra, penile pumps, chapstick, but I think other examples. Chapstick? Uh, other examples. Uh, in like include in in various state by state vending machine sales gun ammo um private jet fuel parts in some states uh yeah it's kind of crazy there's a nonprofit called period law and they have like a whole interactive map where you can go state by state and see like how much is is the sales tax in the state and what are the odd things that aren't tax right um and so and and you know it's not an insignificant amount it can range up to like 11 12 percent right which adds up when you think about like that's a few dollars a month you know and what's their argument of why like the there's no who- argument i think it's purely an archaic law okay. um that being said 
you can see it like in more recent arguments made um, in evaluating bills to take down the tampon tax or get period products to be free in prisons. Like, I think the quote that exemplifies it the most is that in 2017 in Maine, this GOP representative got up to speak out against a bill to get period products to be free in prisons, which failed. And he said, period products should not be free in prisons because they're not meant to be country clubs, right? Where like, I really think that it, as crazy as it sounds to us, like there is sentiment that these are not necessary products. What and about pads? No, but, but none of it. Yeah, none of it. Period tampons, pads are not necessary products. And like I see it in my TikTok comments, right? Where like in my brain, I'm like, well, duh, it's a necessity. But I get a lot of hate of people saying like, why should I have to pay for your tampons and pads? So I think it gets to kind of like the overall argument of like, you know, what is considered necessities. Could you imagine? Well, also when you put it into perspective, because I've learned a lot about like cycle syncing, hormone health, all yeah. the things and how we've been told our whole lives like that's just normal every woman once a month yes. feels like sick as hell and bloated and all of the things but really it's a sign of a hormonal imbalance we're learning so if you can't afford proper medical care magnesium yeah any of these things that help you with hormone health you're probably having really bad symptoms and a really heavy flow so yeah. there's a correlation there so it's like the people with the worst hormonal imbalances in the worst periods not saying people yeah. with more privilege don't have bad periods but i'm just saying they could have really terrible periods what imagine being well, in prison you're just stuffing your pants with toilet paper yeah or i think it's also just like you know i mean it's such an intersectional issue right because then it intersects with healthcare. who can get diagnosed right. with endometriosis when they have it who gets diagnosed sooner and then that link to like who gets recommended hysterectomies more and then it's also linked to like you know, black women are three times as likely to have uterine fibroids, which is like extremely heavy period, a lot of period pain, blood clots. And there hasn't been enough research to really understand why. But I think examples there, right, where it's like, even when you think about how intersectional this issue is from a sustainability, a racial perspective, like how we think about socioeconomic status, it is so intersectional, which is probably why I've, I'm like not bored at all of this work, because I feel like I'm humbled every day by like how much I don't know and like still have work to do on. Right, because you're not just like a silly girl on TikTok obsessed with her period. <laughs> like there's so much more social activism. I think I am also that, but yeah. <laughs> I said you're not just oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I think is really cool though and if people don't know you're the founder of August which I'm now seeing everywhere like <gasps> I go on my boy my not boyfriend I'm so not used to this my fiance <laughs> we work and there's August in there I was in I think Equinox mm -hmm. recently August in there and I personally just like love the product and it feels like it does feel like a luxury to be able to just grab those for free in certain areas and what's so cool is that you guys will Venmo people back the sales tax if they buy it in stores right yeah yeah so if you're in one of the 21 states that still charges the tampon tax you buy we're in about 400 target stores around the country but if you get charged a tampon tax text us a picture of your receipt we have the number on tampon tax back dot uh, com and we'll just Venmo you back within like 48 hours so was that a result of like okay we have a chance and an opportunity to get our product in Target, which could therefore spread our mission wider and make us more money. But like, what can we do to still support our mission? Yeah, I absolutely. And to be honest, like we weren't before we were in stores, we were actually just available online for like two years. And we even when we launched, we never charged the tampon tax wherever possible. Right. So like when you're checking out on the website and it's still the case, wherever we can legally do this, um, which is like almost all the states that have the tampon tax, except for like five. Um, when you're checking out, it literally says like tampon tax covered by us. Right. Love so we it. won't charge it. It will just be absorbed by the company. Um, but when we launched in Target, it was kind of the first point where like we don't we don't oversee that transaction, right? Because like the store is doing that, meaning we have no control over the ability to absorb it. And so I think for us, it was like, how do we stay true to our mission even as we expand as a company? And what does that look like? And my co-founder was the one who kind of figure out, figured out how to operationally execute the tampon tax back coalition. It's genius. It's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really is because so many brands try to kind of tie themselves to a mission or tie themselves to a charity just to kind of almost save face yeah. and because like that's what Gen Z is attracted to and whatever like you see so many brands just trying to tie themselves to a mission 
but you're the definition of actually like mission first. I think everything you're doing is so admirable, so important, your mission first. It started with your passion for learning about period poverty and all the things, which where did you first learn about this? Because you're, I mean, you mentioned on another podcast I listened to you on that there was not any like nonprofit or any organization supporting period poverty. And that's why you started yours initially. So then where did you first hear about it? I don't think that there are any organizations that were specifically focused on a national level and engaging young people in it. Um, And so I think that there was that gap, right? But I mean, I first learned about the issue just directly from people who are experiencing it, right? Um, At the time, I was doing quite a bit of volunteer work, you know, as a high schooler at my church. And also at the same time, it was... uh, It was a time when I was talking to a lot of homeless women on my commute to school, um, which was like two hours long at the time on public transport um, in Portland, Oregon. And it wasn't the sort of thing where like I immediately was like, oh, what do you do for your period? It was like (laughs) many conversations that led up to that. Right. And it was like conversations about like, what is your living situation? Like, where are you from? How did you get here? Like, do you work? Like, where do you sleep? Like, I was so curious about like their experience. And I think a lot of that was rooted in like, what I was going through with my family at the time where we were living with friends. um, And I think we were just thinking a lot about necessities and what are necessities. Um, And so, yeah, I would say it just came up in conversation. And I think once you hear about it, you kind of, it just like is an issue that I became obsessed with. Like, how have I never thought of this before? Um, You know, why, why, why are tampons and pads not provided? Don't they provide them at shelters? Why not? Oh, and then talking to the shelters and the shelters being like, it's too expensive or people don't ask for them. And then why don't they ask for them? And so I think I just kind of went down this just spiral of like getting more and more obsessed with the issue, thinking more about it. And the more I learned about it, even things like, oh, periods are a leading cause of absenteeism for girls worldwide, right? And um, I think the effects of of cultures and stigmas around periods internationally is a huge hindrance for gender equality. Um, it was just an issue I got really obsessed with. Okay. You mentioned the stigma against periods. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I guess my question is like now that you've kind of made periods cool on TikTok – trying (laughs) do you have younger girls who are just getting their periods reaching out to you all the time asking questions yeah a a lot and I think that I will say like I think it's what keeps me going is continuing to get inbound from people who are asking like basic questions right and some of those include like what is the slimy worm coming out out of me and they're talking about vaginal discharge right right? or they have no one to ask they have no one to ask right or hey um i only bled for two days is that normal and look i'm not a doctor but what i can do is work with doctors to like have medically accurate information and i would say that the questions and inbounds that we get from commenters or followers is why education is such a big piece of August, right? Like, so even before we launched product, August had built out Ask August on our website, which is just like doctor verified answers to your basic questions. One of the most, probably like the two most common questions I see over and over again are, will I lose my virginity if I use a tampon? And what hole does the tampon go into? Answer those questions right now. Yeah. So virginity is a social construct and a lot of, I mean, a lot of like the myth around you'll lose your virginity is because like virginity is tied to this piece of tissue that you're born with called the hymen. So like when people say like cherry, yeah, the cherry. (laughs) But um, the thing is that your hymen will stretch like from exercise. It can stretch from anything. And virginity is also just like a social construct that was made to like oppress and shame women and like pleasure. Keep them pure and exactly and virgin. Virgin. And um and 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 so I think that for us, like we that's how we answer the question. And I mean, you have three holes down there and your tampon goes into the vagina. Another thing that you just mentioned is your family. You were living with other people and getting curious, talking to other homeless women. This might be a question you've never been asked before. Yeah. And it just popped into mind. Now that you've seen so much success. You have success as a brand founder, as an influencer and content creator. Do you ever feel almost like a sense of guilt or any, or do you feel more of a sense of pride when it comes to Mm. you're still working to help those who are suffering through poverty, but now you have this privilege that you didn't grow up with? Is there like, what is kind of like your emotions around that once you have found success 
I think that the older I get, the more I realize that I've always been really privileged and because privilege is such a spectrum, right? And so even if my family was experiencing like living below the poverty line or not having health insurance or like a permanent address, like I was very privileged in the sense that like my mom went to Harvard, my dad went to Brown, like college was always, it wasn't an, it wasn't an option. It was an expectation. Right. And so I think that like, I grew up in a very like intellectual family where like, even if we weren't rich monetarily, we were very rich, like intellectually and education wise. And I think the fact that like, even being 16 and, and having the confidence to feel like, oh, I can like start a nonprofit. And like, I know um, how to network and do that. I think the older I get, the more I realize like how I've always been privileged right and that privilege might not have looked like the number in our bank account but look look like it in different things I think I feel probably a mix of both I would I, I would say like not guilt or pride I think purely like responsibility of like the more I recognize my privilege the more I'm like or I think I've all this is what really sparked a lot of my work 10 years ago was like even at 16 I was like wait my family might be going through this hard time. We might be experiencing like what's defined as like legal homelessness, but I've never had to put trash in my pants, right? I've never had to use socks as a pad. Um, And I think that that privilege check was like feeling the responsibility of if I know about this issue and I know that I have the privilege to do something about it, like why wouldn't I do it, right? And so you could call that guilt being absolved a bit by doing some of that work, but I would say like responsibility is probably what I feel the most. I think it's self-awareness. And it also proves the importance of gratitude because you can sit and sulk in all of the things that aren't right or you can be grateful for all the things that are. And the fact that you can look back and be like, I grew up in such an intellectual family, which clearly has been passed down to you. I mean, you started a nonprofit, successful company, social media, like you are so well-spoken and articulate and able to be an activist for so many women around the world. Like you can recognize that privilege, I think, due to gratitude. Yeah, I mean, I think that it I think that if you recognize privilege and are not thankful, then I think you just end up ignorant. <laughs> you know? Totally. So like it's possible to do that. Um, but I don't think that's the goal for me totally. for sure. Yeah. But what I find really also important about your story, I think your message and your mission and your company is so important. But I also feel like there's something untapped about you that I've heard you touch on a little bit. But I feel like you've struggled with mental health and you are, I've mentioned this so many times, but like you started a nonprofit, you're a brand founder, you're a content creator, you make like 10 videos a day or something insane like that. And you suffered with like workaholicism, workaholism, however you want to describe it. And you had mentioned on, I saw somewhere that you went to rehab with other addicts who were addicted to substances and you were addicted to work. Yeah. Could you tell us the story about that? In 2020, I went to rehab for a couple months and um, it was like just a mental health rehabilitation place. And How did that happen? Did you say, I want to go to rehab? No, okay. my family, Great. my family, my boyfriend were like, you, I mean, I was like very suicidal, like very, okay. and a part of it was related to my work, right? I had kind of gone through this point where suddenly I lost the crutch that I had to just throw myself into work. And part of that was because um of like public backlash and feeling like I wasn't kind of welcome in in the working space was this pre-August yeah this is pre-August like this is after my first and second company so my second company was like a Gen Z marketing agency was like I was on book tour like I was crazy busy had just run for office before the pandemic the pandemic hits and I have this fucking mental breakdown and I think part of it was before I was like literally physically running away from any trauma like I was on a plane once a day essentially doing full-time school and then the pandemic happens and I was like I don't know I just felt like I had I I felt like I didn't have as much to do and I tied so much of my self-worth to like how busy I was and how occupied I was that it really affected the way I thought about like myself so I ended up in rehab and as part of why I was there and how you get like accepted in or like kind of evaluated was that you have to go through addiction treatment and the whole like 12 steps program and I was doing it alongside people who were their addiction to work uh, or to sex, um, to like harder drugs. And I was there for addiction to work. And it was actually really hard because I think that one of the I don't even want to say I don't know if it's privileged so much as like 
being a workaholic, like I don't just mean like, oh, you know, work hard, play hard. I mean, like I didn't poop for two weeks because I would be like, oh, I can get three emails out in the time it would take me to poo. Like I didn't sleep. I was like, just bring your computer to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like it was just like the time. It, I like I would just like it was irrational. Um, right. Obsessive. Obsessive and like did not feel like anything without it. And so I would say that for me, like, you know, it was it was really hard because the things that are uh, different, the, the things that are a result of your being a workaholic are like positive things in society. Right. You make money, you gain status, you gain privilege, you um, just build a career, build your resume. And I think the workaholic tendencies had led me to a lot of things in my life that I'm really thankful for getting into Harvard, having a full ride to Harvard. You know, I think these different elements that um I got to because I was such a workaholic in part, you know, rewarded. Yeah. And, and so it was actually really hard. And I think a lot of my being aware of privilege probably comes from like going through that addiction treatment with people who were able to kind of call my BS and be like, you know, cause it was hard. We would have to do like six hours of group therapy a day and they'd be like, big whoop. Like you have a job versus they're there because they've like lost a job, you know? And I think like feeling that, okay, I have these issues I need to work through and it's an immense privilege to be where I am. And like, what do I do with that? I can imagine because my sister is an addict and I've visited her rehab several times. I've been into AA meetings. So like I can imagine you almost feeling, I don't know that guilt's the right word, but just feeling like everyone's like well lucky you that like that's your issue kind of thing there was like a lot of anger towards me at the beginning and I would say that like and I was also there at the height of the pandemic before the 2020 election as like the only progressive politically person there oh man and so there was a lot of anger towards me at the beginning and I think it's something that like we really worked through group therapy and I think it was something also that like I did a lot of work in, in, in individual therapy to be like okay you know this is something that I need to work through and recognizing the effects of being addicted to work. I'll take her. <laughs> Mimi's vibing. Are you sure. <laughs> I would say an effect of rehab was like, first of all, I learned to sleep, which sounds like kind of crazy, but like mm-hmm. I love sleeping and I used to think sleep was a waste of time and I would avoid it. I would, you know, find substances and just random things to keep me awake. And now I love sleep de- desperately. And um, I think it's something that I had to like really learn. And it took a lot of like medication and, you know, practicing and um, being like literally not in the world for, uh, you know, in this outside world for a while. And so I learned a lot from it. And now like mental health is like definitely a key priority for me. I think that's an interesting result of like one places like Harvard, but also entrepreneurial content. Capitalism. I, yeah. I think yeah. there's a lot of messaging and it's and we're so impressionable like the younger we are there's a lot of messaging around and as a young founder I'm sure it was so like really stuck with you clearly around you know you just have to hustle at the beginning of your career and stay up till 4 a.m and sacrifice your sleep like we all do it that's how you get it done but it takes kind of falling into that to realize that I actually can't work efficiently unless I'm well rested. Like every part of your health stems and productivity yeah. stems from sleep. What else have you t- – because you're still a high performer. You're still someone who has multiple jobs. You're entrepreneurial. It's not like you went to rehab and then came out and said, I'm not working anymore. So it sounds like you maybe just work smarter now and prioritize your own mental health. What else have you learned? And like what what else have you learned about managing your mental health? Yeah, I mean I think that like I definitely – I think that a lot of it is I when I was in rehab, I got diagnosed with like borderline personality disorder. And I would say that learning about BPD was really helpful because when I got the diagnosis, I was like really scared, really ashamed. And then I got the diagnosis and it was like, wait, this really gives me language to understand like what I've been feeling and what I've been going through. And thus it helps me have some more solutions to understand like what I can be doing better. Right. And so I think that for me coming out of it, it was thinking I can, I can live, I can experience pleasure, I can experience work, I I can experience success, but I need to be watchful and stay grounded in like my why. And I need to be good about saying no to opportunities. Like I say no to a lot of things um, because I feel like secure and not needing to say yes to everything. I used to feel like I needed to say yes to everything because otherwise I was going to like lose or I was going to lose out. out Exactly. It was like, 
FOMO about everything, FOMO about social life, FOMO about um, just visibility opportunities. And I think I eventually got like a lot of criticism for that, even in my professional life, because I was taking up so much space without like much thoughtfulness. And now I really think like even before I say yes to a podcast, I'm like, why am I going? Am I the best person to do it? Why am I saying yes? Like, is it worth my time? Is it, you know, I think just being really um, choosy about it. I mean, you could say like abundance mindset versus scarcity mindset. Yeah. I would say a lot of it too is just like really being aware of what I need and like what I enjoy, right? I don't enjoy clubbing and going out and getting drunk. Like I want to stay home and watch TV and hang out with my dog. And I don't, um, I don't need like a crazy, I don't know, like, I don't need a crazy social life. I, like, really just need to, like, sleep eight to ten hours a night, and I'm, like, okay with that. And I think being comfortable with what I need and, like, what makes my cup full and what self-care looks like for me is, like, very – is very central to, like, my own life and rituals. Totally. And I feel like you're very passion-driven. So it's, like, how do we lean into the passion because it fills us but not overdo it where it depletes us? Yeah. I feel like that's kind of the balance. How are you managing your relationships – while living with BPD. How has that kind of affected romantic relationship, work relationships? I know you have a lot of you have a team around you. You have a big yeah. company. So how are you managing it in a really cuz it sounds like okay, we understand the relationship to self and the self-awareness and what fills me, what depletes me. Yeah. How about your relationships with others? I am miraculously still with the same boyfriend I was when I went to rehab. He really wow. stood with me through all of it. I think saw me at my worst and um, he's my baby daddy for my dog now. You know, we have this dog together. But I would say that for me, it's a lot of open discussion. And I think that the people who are around me, I, I have, I'm very open dialogue. I'm very interested in feedback and just like constantly being more self-aware. I would also say like BBD is super manageable. And even now when I take like any tests or anything, I'm probably like 50-50 now, depending where I am in like my mental health space, will I test for BPD, right? Because BPD traits can be like unlearned or subsided at different points in your life. But I would say that a big part of it is that it's like an ongoing practice. It's an active practice of like dialectical behavioral therapy and managing different symptoms. I think also like, I think that for me especially, I have to be hyper cognizant about like my relationship to work, right? Am I working because I feel like a piece of worthless shit without work or am I working because I'm passionate and I'm excited about where we're going, right? And I think that continuing to be as aware about that as possible, really grounded in my why is is central to a lot of that. A lot of that, yeah. What does the testing look like? I mean, it's different. I think depending on who you go to, it when I first did it, it was like two hours of questions so and tests. It's, it's like a personality test. Yes. Like when, because like I was tested for ADHD and stuff when I was younger, and it's like a therapist keeps you in a room for two hours. It's like that. It's like a mix of that and like um just uh like online tests where you're going through like on a scale of how often do you feel this. I think also like there are certain uh, the example I always use is like the certain beliefs that I had around BPD over like. I believe that I am like not worthy, right? Or I often don't feel in my body, right? I think in with BPD, there are nine traits. And if you hit seven out of nine of those, then you're diagnosed with BPD. And some of those include like, you know, just impulse impulsivity and how does that manifest, like relationships, all of that. So what are some things from DBT that you feel have really helped you personally? Because I find with CBT, DBT, all of the things like, even just regular talk therapy, there are some things that will hit and resonate with you yeah. more than it would someone else. And there's like certain things that you just take away that just I, I always compare it to like skiing. Like I tried skiing four times and finally in the last hour of the fourth time it clicked. It. Yeah. All of a sudden it's like you can hear the same message 10 times. But if someone says it in a different way, it clicks for the yeah. rest of your life. So what are some things that have kind of helped you? I think it's probably different for everybody. So like take what, what totally. my experience is with a grain of salt. But I would say like I've tried so many of them. I was diagnosed with uh, PTSD when I was like in high school, did a lot of CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, which like for people who don't know the way I would describe it is like it's rewriting your narrative. So it's a bit of like desensitizing you to trauma, but then also like reframing how you remember it. Um, and so I would say I've tried that. I've tried DBT. DBT is more like self-talk, right? So it's recognizing like like I, I often will kind of bully myself about like how you're feeling is wrong or like I would say like sadness is a waste of time, 
like just stop being sad it's a waste of time you're stupid for being sad and you're lazy for being sad and I would like really bully myself with that versus DBT is kind of it's all about like wise mind and taking a step back and being like, no, emotions are valid. Why Why am I feeling this way? Like if I'm feeling anger, what is the underlying grief or sadness that is under my anger? And I think it's more about like self-awareness and being able to really talk yourself through a lot of these different, you know, experiences. Rather than talking yourself it's like talk your the idea of talking yourself out of it, not into it. Exactly, exactly. And so and and you know, even now, like I'm I'm in a very stable place, but like suicidal ideation doesn't necessarily go away, right? And so I think that part of when I get to those darker moments, I really pull on my DBT. I really pull on my DBT to say like, why am I feeling this way? What is the rationality behind that? Um, you know, what are my coping mechanisms that I can do for that? And so I think it's really just about those like flags and self-awareness, which is like an ongoing, it's a muscle you have to really stretch. Absolutely. And how are you with communicating it to your partner? I'm not always great about it. I think he, he's been amazing just in holding me accountable. And I'll say like probably one of the most romantic things that he's ever done is when I got diagnosed, I had never heard of BPT. He had never heard of it. He went out and read like all the books. He read these books like living with someone or loving someone with BPD. There's one about like walking on eggshells and like he did his homework. And actually as part of your, um, I mean, you probably know from your family experience when you have someone who goes to rehab, part of the requirement is that there's like ongoing family therapy with who you're going to be discharged to. And I was actually discharged to him. So um, mm. we he did family therapy with me for quite a bit. I think that honestly, it, it's been an experience even in like the last few years like it's now been three and a half years where uh we've also had to kind of balance like not having a codependent relationship right because like we have gone through so much in our relationship and I mean he's also seen me through raising capital for the company starting the company launching the company I remember the night before August launched June 2021 I was like puking all night because I was so nervous and I had never puked from being nervous but I just felt like I would poured my heart. I had given everything and I didn't know how it was going to go. And he was just like there tapping my back, making sure I was okay. So he's really seen me through like a lot. Get yeah. this man on the podcast. <laughs> like <laughs> he seems amazing. He also has no social media. So we the really best. balance each other out. <laughs> the best. Same. My fiance literally, if he's ever on social media, it's like to post a picture that's like everyone's like, what the fuck even yeah. is that? It's like his ass. Like yeah. something crazy. Yeah. Um, okay, first of all, thank you for sharing all that. Of course. I want to ask you a few more like TMI questions before we get into the ending segment. Your dog is the cutest thing in the entire world. <laughs> this is when she starts being like, all right, all right, time. we're ready. <laughs> she, she's literally our clock. She's yeah. like, it's the end of the recording. Okay, two TMI questions I want to ask you. No such thing as TMI. True, we're breaking the stigma. What are your thoughts on period sex? I think period sex can be super helpful for people, period pain, all of that, but really? I am not a fan of it. Same. So I feel like I'm all about everybody should have try it. I also if like there have been instances where like I accidentally got my period and a guy or a girl that I was hooking up with was like, ew, I was like immediately no immediately no totally so even if I'm not in, into it if you're not into it for a reason like because you think it's gross I'm like that's a deal breaker and studies show that like you I mean one your hormones are elevated so it's very common to feel hornier have a higher sex drive when you're on your period it's been studies have shown that it can be helpful to alleviate period cramps that being said when I'm on my period especially on my heavy days the last thing I want to do is be like touched I just feel like a fat cow like no, I yeah. just feel like the most disgusting person because yeah you just you feel bloated and achy and yeah. crampy and I'm just not in the mood yeah so I guess my answer is like go for it if you're in the mood if you're in the yeah. mood I personally happen to not be in the mood right and it just smells metallic-y and then yeah. all I'm thinking about is my period it's not <laughs> hot in my opinion yeah I'm not personally into it yeah okay Cycle syncing. I know you speak with a lot of doctors to make sure you're giving like accurate information because you're getting so many questions flooding in at all times. You also created a product that helps yeah. periods. So like you're definitely knowledgeable. Have you learned a lot about cycle syncing? What are your thoughts? Do you think it's bad? Cycle syncing in terms of syncing with other people? No. Or sorry. understand. Oh, yes. It's yes, like yes. a wellness trend. Yes. So cycle syncing. I mean, I think there is 
there's not a lot of active research at this moment because it's rather new, right? It is like a newer fad. That being said, I think that it makes a lot of sense, Me right? Too. Because your period is only one small part of your overall menstrual cycle. Your menstrual cycle is happening constantly and your menstrual cycle is defined by fluctuations in your home hormones and we know hormones are kind of like linked to everything they're linked to how you feel they're linked to like any fogginess with your brain so then like of course you, the things you'll be best set out to do are different at different parts of your cycle I'm not an expert on it I haven't done it personally I'm actually really bad about tracking my own period and I have like sometimes an irregular one so I would say it is really different for everybody but like for some people, cycle syncing can look like, you know, diet, how you think about your social calendar. Um, and I think it makes total sense. Yeah, I more so use it. I don't I don't like obsessing over anything. So I never like to get in the nitty gritty of like, this is what I should be eating. This is what, what yeah. I should be working out, whatever. But I more so use it as like period awareness. It's yeah. like being aware of where I am at my cycle so that if I'm more emotional, if I'm going to have more yeah. energy this week than the other, like I just think the awareness is key. Yeah. Because it helps me to not have negative self-talk. It helps me almost like plan my month. Like, yeah. oh, I'm going to podcast that week instead of like that's going to be day one of my period or around there. Like maybe let's not make that my most social day or yeah. like the day of po batching podcast recording. Yeah. So I more so use it as like an intuitive awareness. Yes. Well, and I think that even goes to show like whether or not you call it cycle syncing, I think that it's just like I'm all about breaking stigma around periods so that you're thinking actively about it so that you can just have more of an awareness right so that like you know I just think I'm more about just like having a more like aware relationship with your body relationship with your period totally okay lastly ending segment what is your top self-care tip I think it's sleep 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 as much as possible <laughs> Sleep, hydrate, get a dog, get a dog. Oh my gosh. I, Mimi, we, I rescued her, um, probably a little over a year ago and I never understood like people who are obsessed with their dogs. Like I was not like a crazy dog person. And then I got Mimi and I was like, oh, I have a reason to get out of bed. I have a reason to feed myself because when she, like, I forget to feed myself, but I never forget to feed her, you know? Totally. So like having a dog has been amazing and, um, yeah, we're very attached. Emotional support animal. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Okay. Are you a podcast listener? Yes. Okay. What's your favorite podcast? Acquired. It's actually like a tech podcast. Yeah, I won't be listening. No, won't be you won't in. be listening to it. <laughs> um, but I really, really liked Acquired. That's been a really good one. <laughs> okay. Wellness product you can't live without right now other than August products. August for sure. Um, Let me think. Okay. I don't even know if I would call call this a wellness product, but it was the first thing that came to mind. I have an AeroPress. Okay. Do you know what an AeroPress is? The coffee machine? The coffee thing. It's like, it doesn't use any electricity or anything. You like do it with your hand. It's kind of like a French press. Like a drip thing, right? Co not really. It uses like suction. French press yeah, vibes. Yeah, kind okay. of French press vibes. But like I got that and it's kind of made my whole like ritual of coffee in the morning very concrete. So that's been a really big one. Um, but I would also say like I'm a big user of like rosemary oil like Ooh. for my hair. My hair is a little bit greasy. I literally showed up to this podcast, hair oil in, like matching PJs on. Like Listen, it's there to self-care. You literally <laughs> exactly. came on brand. No, that's what I was thinking. I, I almost walked out. My boyfriend was like, that's what you're wearing. And I was like, Okay, it's a self-care podcast. I wear a sweatshirt yeah. and a braid. Also. I was like, I can bring the dog. I can do these things. So, but, you know, here we are. <laughs> I love it. You gave us a promo code. I'm going to put it in the intro of the podcast. Where can everyone find you? All things August, everything. At Nadia Okamoto on socials. Um, and it's august.go for the website. And we're just at it's august. Yeah. <laughs>